now it's time to welcome our speakers for today. The mystery is finally revealed. Dr. Ryan Quist is the Behavioral Health Director in Sacramento County. He's Vice President for the County Behavioral Health Directors Association and co-chairs its Medi-Cal Policy Committee. In Sacramento County, his focus is on mental health and substance abuse services for the homeless and criminal justice populations and bolstering the crisis continuum of care to prevent psychiatric hospitalizations. With Dr. Quist today is Bill Marr, one of the speakers for Stop Stigma Sacramento, a project working to reduce the stigma and discrimination attached to mental illness in our area. In 2008, Bill suddenly began suffering from panic attacks. He sought out the Anxiety Treatment Center of Sacramento, where his anxiety was diagnosed and suggestions for real improvement introduced. He hopes that by sharing his story, he'll help all of us view mental illness in a completely new way. So let's get right to that. Dr. Quist, I think we're starting off with you. So go ahead and take it away. Afternoon, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for having me here today. I really uh, appreciate the recognition of the importance of mental health within Sacramento County's communities and um, appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, what, what sort of factors are influencing what's going on in our communities right now. I want to start, start by just acknowledging that um, I think that more now more than ever, um, we as a community understand that mental health is not just something that's important for a select few. This is something that impacts in all of us. Um, and as we're now uh, two and a half years into a pandemic, we've all experienced uh, a great deal of various stressors in our lives. And I, I don't mean to um, over dramatize, but I think it is important to acknowledge all that we have collectively gone through. When COVID first hit, we, we began having to do behaviors we've never done before in terms of self-isolation, um, breaking us off from the important people in our, in our lives and having to change a great deal of our, our normal habitual uh, um, uh, activities that, that we're, we were so used to. Um, shortly after COVID hit, there were a number of conversations around racial injustice, which brought its own set of anxieties. Whether you were, whatever your perspective was on that topic, um, as it relates to the, the um, protests and other activities that went on along, uh, along there, um, the fact of the matter was is very difficult topics were being discussed and leading to anxiety within ourselves as well as within some of uh, the diverse communities within Sacramento County. Um, from there, we, we had climate anxiety as it relates to fires and drought. And some of these things were impacting either directly people's lives as it relates to their ability to um, make ends meet and you know, do the work that they do. And in other ways, it was also impacting family members that were impacted by the various um, events that were happening throughout the state of California. We saw uh, anxiety result from what was going on in schools with our youth. Um, and uh, uh, parents and caregivers were having to deal with something they haven't had to deal with in terms of um, supporting youth learning at home in a remote sort of environment. Um, since then, I, we could keep going with this list uh, quite extensively, and I, I'll wrap it up, but just the, the mask anxiety, vaccine anxiety, and then most recently, we have had a very tragic shooting downtown here in Sacramento that that all these different topics lead to uh, collective um, and multiplicative uh, levels of anxiety that we, we keep sort of rehashing various uh, uh, trauma responses within our, the, the members of our communities. And just wanna acknowledge that and recognize that mental health is something that influences all of us. I can tell you that all the way through all of uh, the past two and a half years, there have been countless times where we've been asked to come and share um, messages around how to do self-care and how to help those around us. And, and so I, I am going to ask you to also help spread this message that we all have the, the tools. Um, I mean, if, if nothing, after two and a half years, we know that Sacramento County residents are resilient. We have um, taken on all of these various challenges and we've come out the other side and we continue to be resilient as the world continues to throw other stressors and anxiety at us. Um, so uh, join in helping spread the word regarding 
um, uh, the importance of self-care and uh, countless times I've uh, been asked to come and talk about what are those strategies for help, uh, helping make a difference. And really it comes back to what we call the ABCs of trauma. A stands for being aware of how our, we're reacting to trauma, how are our bodies reacting, how are our minds reacting, how are our emotions reacting, our thoughts are reacting. We have to be aware of that. We have to be aware of how it's Im impacting people around us and recognizing that our loved ones and our friends are being impacted by these various things. So that's A for awareness. Um, B is for balance and we need balance between work, life and a higher purpose. And so the importance of making sure that we're finding a time to have a meal together, sit down, well first uh, make a meal together, then sit down and have a conversation over that meal or whatever the, the right um, uh, coping strategy that, that we, you know, each person has their own different coping strategy. For some people it's exercise. Uh, so for some people, it's other things. So we need to find what those right strategies are to maintain that balance. And then C is um, uh, C is for um, <laughs> we have A is for um, awareness, B is for balance, and then uh, C is for oh brother, um, heaven. A is for um, awareness, B is for balance. And then C is for, uh, it's basically uh, um, reaching out and connecting with each other. There you go, connecting with each other. Um, and so the idea is you wanna connect with your friends, your family and a higher power. Um, and uh, the way we can do that is again, making sure that we're, we're uh, supporting each other. Apologies for that. Um, the, one of the things I was asked to talk about were the importance of our, um, uh, what are some of the challenges that are being experienced by behavioral health uh, right now? Uh, one, of the, one of the greatest challenges that we're experiencing are um, workforce issues. And before, before COVID, we had a workforce shortage, and now we have a workforce crisis. We're seeing our um, workforce, uh, they're being impacted by the same stressors all the rest of us are being impacted by. And that has to do with um, uh, you know, they have family members that are having to isolate. They have, they've had to isolate. They have youth that are home from school. Um, this has all led to the same type of stressors that all of the rest of us have experienced. And on top of that, our workforce is being asked to show up to work every day and support others. And that can be a really tolling um, uh, experience on, on our workforce. On top of that, um, the cost of living and the cost of, um, and the salaries have become extremely competitive across our um, entire uh, uh, network of employers. And so we're all sort of competing with each other right now for an already scarce workforce. And what does that mean? That means that um, wherever you're receiving services right now, it's very likely that your behavioral health providers are carrying caseloads of two to three people. Um, because everybody's having a hard time filling, filling their vacancies. And that means that it's harder to sometimes access services and get in to be able to see, be able to see a provider. Um, so uh, we certainly are advocating at the, at the state level in order to try to develop uh, workforce development initiatives. And uh, our administration is extremely uh, supportive and working on that. We, we uh, here in Sacramento County, we have a, um, a loan repayment program that we've implemented just recently that uh, service providers who are working with our um, with uh, county behavioral health are able to apply to have their student loans uh, forgiven. So um, there, we need more though. And so we continue to advocate with our administration around that and they're extremely supportive of that. And we look forward to the types of solutions that we might be able to see around our, our workforce development issues. We need more, more people to do this work though, and especially more people who are of diverse backgrounds that actually reflect the, um, the, the communities that we're serving. And that includes both a cultural background as well as linguistic background for, um, for our diverse communities. Um, one of the other things we're seeing, and a lot of it has been uh, extremely, um, uh, uh, exaggerated as a result of the pandemic 
is the homeless situation. We've heard lots of conversation around that, um, especially around here in Sacramento County where, we're, where we don't have a lot of extra housing available for individuals. Um, we, we have an, uh, I'm sorry, a vacancy rate of around 1%. And so that makes it very difficult for us to be able to um, house those that even when we have resources, um, Sacramento County Behavioral Health funds flexible housing for our contract providers to be able to house those that they're serving. And the fact of the matter is though, is that we, we even with the funding, it's difficult to identify where those units are that will take our, 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 our consumers. A lot of times our consumers have additional needs that sometimes make them less um, uh, attractive to some of the landlords. Sometimes they'll have a criminal background, even if it's far in the past, that can be difficult. Sometimes it has to do with the behaviors that they exhibit. Sometimes it's other things as it relates to some of their symptoms. So it makes it very difficult for us to be able to find appropriate housing for a number of folks. Um, I'm gonna stop and tell you a little bit about uh, Sacramento County Behavioral Health. So um, we're responsible for mental health and substance use services throughout Sacramento County, specifically for the Medi-Cal population. So these are people of lower socioeconomic status um, and actually are on Medi-Cal. And we provide an array of services re reaching from prevention, early intervention, all the way up to very high level services. One an example on the mental health side is um, our full service partnership program, which is basically a do whatever it takes sort of a model where we wrap uh, an entire treatment team around individuals in order to in order to help support them in whatever way that they need. And then of course, we also um, are responsible for uh, funding our inpatient level of care. Um, we've been putting a lot of attention during COVID um, in terms of being able to develop additional uh, resources and um, programming that will help serve as an alternative to inpatient care in order to help um, people step down or avoid uh, an inpatient hospitalization. It's been very difficult during COVID because we know that our emergency departments were quite impacted. Um, uh, so, uh, like I said, we're responsible for mental health services for uh, those with Medi-Cal, but we've also been advocating at the state level around making sure that people are able to access uh, services through their um, private insurance programs. And so one of the messages that we continue to get out there is that if you need help, get help. If you've been experiencing symptoms uh, for more than two weeks that are leading to challenges in your work or uh, life in some other way, please be sure to reach out and ask for help. And that, that, what that looks like, if you, if you have private insurance, reach out to your, your private insurance and ask for, and ask for um, a referral to services. Um, if you just need somebody to talk to, there is a, um, uh, a phone line that you can uh, reach as well, which I'll provide in just a little bit. Um, it's, uh, I, uh, let me give you the phone number. Um, I'll give you a sec to grab a pen. It's 833-871-HOPE. That's the HOPE line. And that's a place where you can call if you just need to talk to somebody. Um, and then if you have Medi-Cal and need services, then by all means, uh, please call into our access line and we'll be happy to make referral into, into services. One of the things I'd like to highlight at this, this point though, is I would like to um, point out that May is Mental Health Month. We're just a couple weeks away. This is a month where we um, focus on mental health and we really try to focus our message on um, anti-stigma. Uh, which means that we want to normalize mental health. We all have uh, our varying levels of mental health and all of us have family members or friends that are um, impacted by mental health challenges. And it is extremely important for us to make sure that we get the word out about how to recognize the signs and symptoms of mental health challenges, as well as how to access services. And so that is what our whole May is Mental Health Month event is uh, focused on. Um, draw to your attention to our website that we have. It's called Stop Sigma Stop. Excuse me, Stop Stigma Sacramento org, and um, we have a number of resources on that web page uh, that that you're able to help get our, get the word out. One of the features that we've also developed over the years is something we call our Speakers Bureau. And this is a group of individuals who are willing to come uh, and that are. Uh, 
willing to come. We, we certainly uh, support them in coming to various uh, events such as this in order to tell their story, in order to uh, put a, a face on what mental health and what mental resiliency looks like. And so I'm very pleased today and I'd like to introduce to you Bill Marr, who is um, one of the members of our Speakers Bureau and like for you to hear his story and hear his story of resiliency. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, as, as Ryan indicated, um, I'm part of the Stop Stigma Sacramento Speakers Bureau. Um, it's not always what you think project. Um, there's really three things that we're trying to accomplish in terms of uh, being a speaker and the Speakers Bureau through the Sacramento County Health and Human Services. Um, the first one is reduce stigma associated with mental illness. Um, as somebody who has mental illness, but um, is a lot of other things, whether it be a father or a baseball coach and other things, um, there's still always a little bit of that stigma or shame associated with, you know, having mental illness. Um, the second goal really is to promote mental health and wellness. Um, you know, even for people who don't have, um, let's say, a, a mental illness that, you know, causes them some, some real struggle. Um, and then also the last one, which I think is the most important really is inspire hope for individuals and families living with mental illness. Um, I've sort of been on my journey, if you will, for about 12 years, maybe a little bit longer, actually about 14 years now. And I'm very, very fortunate. Um, I've got a great wife, great support system. Um, but the reason I do these talks, the reason I do the Stop Stigma Speakers Bureau is to hopefully further, you know, the, the project goals um, that I just outlined. So um, I don't really have a, um, I don't really have a script that I follow. I just sort of tell you my story and hopefully hearing my story will, you know, be helpful to, to anybody who's listening or for those that have family members and such that um, have a mental health um, issue they're, they're managing. So as Ryan said, my name is Bill Marr. Um, I live in Folsom. I'm actually moving here to, uh, shortly, but I live in Folsom. I've been here for about 20 years. I'm married. I have three kids, uh, Spencer Cooper Lilly. They're 17, 13, and 12. Um, I um, recently, up until recently, I owned um, an insurance agency. And then I recently sold it back in August to a private equity firm out of Florida. So that was great. But, uh, and I, I, I coach high school baseball. I coach my daughter's softball team. I coach little league for my two boys. Um, you know, I'm a husband, a father, a neighbor, a friend. I'm just, you know, like any other guy. Um, however, I have really, really, really severe anxiety um, one of the things I try to share with people is when I'm doing these talks, I'm always having anxiety. Um, like right now on a scale of one to 10, I'm probably around a six or a seven. Um, I have a lot of anxiety, a lot of sort of, um, not real panic, but you know, I definitely feel it inside my body, you know, the sweaty palms, the tightness in my chest and all the other sort of symptoms that come with sort of that fight or flight response um, when you're having, you know, anxiety, if you will, or you feel like you're having a panic attack. I know I seem very calm and that's because I've done a lot of these talks. And really, like I say, the reason I do this is because I'm hoping to help people who are at the beginning of that journey and who haven't sought help or who are seeking help, but are still struggling um, can hopefully see that, you know, um, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so a little bit about my background. When I was two, uh, my dad left never to be seen again. When I was seven, my mom went to prison. Uh, my mom went to Chowchilla State Prison for Women, spent most of her life there. Um, my stepfather took me in and from the age of seven till about 14, my stepfather and I became very close and had a great relationship. He remarried when I was 14 and my stepmother and I didn't get along. Um, and so at some point, my stepfather and my stepmom pretty much just abandoned me, um, said I was no longer welcome. I couldn't live in their home anymore. And so for about 10 months, a little less than 10 months, I lived homeless. 
uh, when I was 15 in Santa Clara. Um, I slept at the park. I slept at 7-Eleven. I basically slept wherever I could eat. You know, I remember eating out of a garbage can. Um, I just, I had a really rough go of it. At some point, my mom said, hey, you should come live with me. Everything's great. I'm out of prison. So I went to go live with my mom in Crescent City, which is up near the California-Oregon border on the coast. And I wasn't there for very long. And as it turns out, my mom was a fugitive. <laughs> She'd gotten out of prison, reoffended, was rearrested, convicted, and sentenced, and she jumped bail. So while I was living in Crescent City, in the middle of nowhere, in my opinion, I had never been there and I didn't know anybody, the cops came and arrested my mom and there I was alone again um, and really with nowhere to go. By the grace of God, some really wonderful people took me in and said, hey, we're going to give you a place to stay. You can finish high school and, you know, figure it out. So, of course, I took that opportunity, made the most of it. So uh, Greg and Rhonda let me live there. Um, I finished high school with straight A's. I went off to the Army for two years um, when I graduated. Um, when I left the military, I went into law enforcement. I became a, a deputy sheriff in the Bay Area. And I worked in law enforcement for uh, a little, about, about seven years. And the first time I really started having any real severe anxiety or panic attacks, I was on duty. Um, I went to a domestic violence call and I all of a sudden felt my heart pounding and sweaty palms and just, I thought for certain I was dying of a heart attack. So I did what most people do. <laughs> I jumped in my police car, lights and sirens, and drove as fast as I could to the hospital. And once I got there, they said, you know, you're just experiencing extreme stress, anxiety, but you know, you're not having a heart attack, you're healthy. So I knew right then I wasn't going to be able to uh, continue in law enforcement. So eventually I went into banking for about 10 years and then eventually started my own insurance agency and then eventually sold that. Um, so currently I'm, I'm consulting with the company that was, was, uh, that has purchased my firm. Um, when my anxiety got really, really bad, it was July of 2008. I went through about a two week period of time where I couldn't leave my house my anxiety is a form of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. So when I couldn't leave my house for two weeks, what I mean was every time I would leave, I'd go to get coffee or go to the grocery store or anywhere I would go. On the way there, the world felt like it was caving in on me and I couldn't figure out what to do. So my immediate response was always to just go to the emergency room. So I went to the emergency room every day for two weeks, and they just kept saying to me, you have anxiety, you have anxiety. Well, I'd already overcome so much of my life up to that point, you know, so now I'm married, I have three kids, I have a mortgage, I have a company, and I have to figure out how the heck do I manage this debilitating mental illness. So I reached out to Robin Zasio, who is, uh, runs the Sacramento Anxiety Treatment Center, and essentially she just had me do a six pay or excuse me, six week, six hour a day outpatient treatment for program for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, you know, I would check my blood pressure a hundred times a day, which is not normal. Um, if I had a pain in my side, I was convinced I was, you know, I had cancer. Um, any kind of physical abnormalities or anything that I thought about went from the size of an ant to the size of Mount Shasta in my mind. And so the way OCD works and people have it in many forms, my obsession or fear is that I'm going to have a heart attack and die or that some other health complication is going to happen. Um, and then I'm going to end up dying because of it. So if I go outside and it's too hot, um, then I'm worried about heat stroke. If I drive to Los Angeles and I go on Highway 5 versus Highway 9, I'm concerned because there's no hospitals on Highway 5. 99 is much more populated. If I go to a meeting by myself, I don't like doing that for customers, even though I do it, because I'm worried that what if I have a heart attack and then I have to leave the meeting and then I look like a moron and then nobody thinks I'm capable of doing their insurance and now I'm not going to have any business and now I can't feed my family and this is all happening within seconds in my mind of, oh my gosh, like worst case scenario. So obsession is a fear of me having a heart attack. Compulsion is behavior. 
So basically my fear is health. And every time I feel it, I would go to the hospital. Eventually I learned through the anxiety treatment center that it's impossible for your body to stay at that really heightened state of adrenaline. I think we've all probably had an experience where whether it be a car accident or, you know, some traumatic event and you can feel your adrenaline really start to ramp up. Um, your body can't physically stay way up there with that blood, just go, go, go. Eventually what happens is your body just gets tired. So when I do these talks, like right now, I'm exhausted and I'm going to be really, really tired later because Everything inside my body physically right now at this very moment is telling me to go to the hospital and have every test known to man done because then I can rule out everything. But every time I do that, I'm actually reinforcing the behavior of that's the compulsion. So it's the same as somebody who checks the door knob a hundred times before they leave the house. Their fear is if they don't lock the door, something will happen, but they don't believe they locked it. And even if they did, they need to check it a hundred times because they're having physical anxiety over it. So I'm having physical anxiety all the time because I think I'm walking around just waiting for the, my ticker to stop or, you know, whatever happens. Um, so right now, even though I'm having this terrible feeling and it is terrible, um, I know that this is temporary. And that's what I've learned. I've learned that if I can sit with this discomfort long enough, it will go away. And it always goes away. It's just how much pain are you willing to endure? And sometimes it's easier than other times, but there's always pain involved. And so before I go to a client meeting, before I go anywhere, the grocery store, anywhere unfamiliar, I get on Google Maps and I check to see where every hospital is every urgent care center. So because of that, over the last 14 years, I could probably tell anybody on this call where the nearest medical help is within about a 500 mile radius, because I've looked many, many, many times, because that alleviates my anxiety. I've been to the emergency room at Folsom Hospital in the last 14 years, about 300 times. Now that might sound like a lot, and I know it is, but I'm really proud of the fact that of those 300 times I've actually gone to the hospital, I've only gone in a half dozen times. And even when I go in there, I tell them I'm having an anxiety attack. I don't want you to take any tests or check my blood or do any of that stuff, because I know that's just going to lead me down a path of, you know, becoming worse and worse and worse with how I feel about my anxiety. So, um, I basically just put myself through, if I call it the doubt bully, my anxiety has been labeled the doubt bully. If the doubt bully says, if somebody says to me, Bill, we should go camping. I go, great, let's go camping. And then I immediately in my mind say, but there's no hospitals when you go camping. And now I don't want to go. That's the doubt. That's the doubter's disease. That's the anxiety. That's the mental illness trying to drive my behavior. Um, when I started my company 10 years ago, I started and I worked a full year and I made $38 in total income. And my wife thought I was, you know, she's like, this needs to work. I'm like, I know, and it's going to. So there's a part of me that's capable of anything because I started a company and I built it up to be successful and I sold it to a private equity firm. So I love doing these talks because your mental illness doesn't have to be your future. It doesn't have to dictate your behavior. I definitely have workarounds. I still have a lot of idiosyncrasies and, and behaviors that I practice. And I am always with, with anxiety. But anytime the doubt bully tells me you shouldn't do that, I force myself to do it because I know if I don't, it's going to make it harder the next time. So, um, I do these talks because I want people to see that even with all the trauma that you can experience, even with the anxiety, you can still be a father, a dad, a mom, a brother, a sister, an aunt, an uncle, you can own a business. Um, I just refuse to let the doubt bully push me around or bully me. Um, but like I say, after this talk, I'm going to be really, really physically tired because my adrenaline is just flowing at a very high rate right now. 
Um, a couple things I sort of want to end with, if possible. Um, I like leaving everybody with the puppies analogy. And this is really where I think, I think it's applicable with mental illness, but sharing the fact that you have mental illness is very scary and it takes a lot of courage. And I don't pat myself on the back and, and I don't say that to come from a place of arrogance. My reason for saying that is if somebody's brave enough to share with you that they're struggling with any mental illness, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar, any of those things, I think the best thing you can do for that person in that moment is ask them a question and say, what can I do to be helpful in this moment? Because so many people assume they know what the answer is. Um, I was in law enforcement and I put people on health and welfare uh, 5150 holds, if you will. And back then I was so dumb and so uneducated. I just wanted to get these people to a mental hospital so I could go get coffee and not have to deal with them. And now having a mental illness, my level of empathy is completely different. Um, and so if somebody's brave enough to share with you that they're struggling again, try to just be really, really good at listening and ask that real easy question of, hey, in this moment, what can I do to be helpful? And then the last thing I would say is I like to use this box of puppies analogy. Um, I'm a huge dog lover. I love everything about dogs or pretty much any animal. But imagine everybody on this call, we've got, you know, 87 participants. Imagine everybody on this call was in a big room and none of us could speak the same language. But let's assume we were all the same age. So regardless of gender, we've all had experiences up to this point in our life at the age of, let's say, 45. So we've all been raised differently. We've all had different parents, different socioeconomic upbringings, different color pants we wear, different foods we like, all of those things. And we can't communicate verbally because we all speak a different language. If I walk into this room and I hold up a box of the most adorable puppies on the planet, and we all can't communicate verbally, I feel like the one thing that everybody in the room would probably say is, oh, right? Because you see that box of puppies and you just go, oh my gosh, I love them. I just want to pet them and hold them. Well, that's who we all are. At our core, the way we were brought into this world, that's who we are at our core. And what that is, is love. And that feeling of love is what transcends all the nonsense. And so I would say if and when possible, when you're talking with somebody who has a mental illness or any illness or any struggle, try to remember that you're filled with love and come from that place of love and empathy so that you can help them, you know, manage and, and get to a better place with their anxiety. So again, I appreciate the time today. And my biggest reason for doing these talks is to hope that it in some way can help people get further down the path of recovery with their mental illness. And now I guess it's time for questions and answers. Great. Thank you so very much, Dr. Quist, for this incredibly priceless information that you've provided and Bill for your courage and vulnerability and transparency, all incredibly helpful. One of the, the first questions that I think is, would be helpful um, that someone asked is, how is mental illness defined, Dr. Quist, and how would someone know they need to ask for help? Uh, mental illness, uh, is a technically, it's a diagnosis that would have to be provided by somebody who has the right training and background in order to do that. I think for this group, I think the most important thing for you to understand is this is a situation where due to uh, a, a mental disorder, someone is uh, experiencing extreme emotional and uh, or somatic uh, responses that end up um, disrupting your ability to do your daily behavior. So. Um, if you're seeing a disruption in a way that it would impact your ability to do work, inability to maybe go to school, um, inability to interact with others uh, on a, in an um, appropriate manner, um, then this is a, sort of a situation where you should reach out and, and get some help. Other, other more subtle indicators are 
changes in um, uh, your, your interactions with other, where maybe you start to isolate, you start trying to avoid people. Um, maybe you'll see uh, changes in appetite, where you'll see people not eat uh, regularly or eat uh, as sort of um, a coping mechanism where they're eating abundantly. Um, did I already say that uh, we also see uh, changes in sleeping patterns? And sometimes those sleeping patterns can be so uh, different that then it starts to disrupt their ability to do the types of activities they need to in their daily life. Those are some of the, the types of things to watch out for. To be honest, if you see anything where somebody starts to just start acting differently, talk to them about it and ask them what, what they're experiencing. And if it starts to sound like it's a, a result of some sort of unexpected or unexplainable or new sort of an emotional reaction, that might be something to really explore. And first, of course, we wanna to try to help them cope with that uh, situation. If those symptoms continue on for more than a couple of weeks, then, then that's time for us to uh, re reach out and seek care. Well, that, in, in fairness, I think that's a, in a perfect world, somebody might be able to admit they're having trouble, but don't most of us just because of ego and perhaps ignorance say we're fine when we're really not? That's absolutely the case. Yeah, we certainly see. Um, and, and, you know, the extent to which um, when people are, you know, sometimes people aren't ready for care right out the gate. Um, it, it sometimes takes a while for them to uh, recognize the challenge. And that's off the easiest way to sometimes work on that is help reflect back to them what you're seeing. This is a sort of thing we even do with <clears throat> my niece and nephew. Um, I see that you are, and so you can do this, of course, not using the same language. You wouldn't use the same language with an adult, but the same, the same idea applies. I see that you're acting in this way. You know, I see you acting out. You seem angry. You seem agitated. Do you, what's going on there? And um, sort of have a conversation around what it is that they're experiencing. And maybe there's an explainable situation that it's uh, state dependent as opposed to being a mental illness, but maybe it is something that, that needs to be explored further. So sort of just making sure that we're talking about it. That's the most important thing is that they know that you're ready to talk about it when they're ready to talk about it. Good, that's helpful. Uh, someone's asked what programs are available for people who don't have mental um, health care as part of their own health care system or their provider um, that's offered? Where do they go? So first I'd like to um, highlight that we did uh, successfully pass, oh shoot, I'm gonna get, get the, I think it's AB 855, um, which is a mental health parity law, which says that if all private insurance programs have to cover mental health care the same way that they cover physical health care. So all, all private insurance, uh, even if they um, don't advertise it as, um, as much as we would like them to, all private insurance progr programs do have a coverage for mental health. Um, so that's one thing I'd like to say. But if, you're, if, you don't have, if you don't have private insurance and if you're eligible for Medi-Cal, well, even if you don't know if you're eligible for uh, Medi-Cal, please feel free to call the county and we'll certainly help make arrangements for linkage to you for whatever uh, appropriate and available uh, resources there are. So I, I have some friends that have been trying to get some mental health care assistance, and they seem to come up against that exact work, 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 excuse me, workforce crisis that you're talking about in virtually all other industries. Um, are mental health care providers being increased either within our city, state, federally, that there's more available because so many people seem to be in different levels of crisis right now? Yeah, um, we're, we're definitely doing, we're, we're, this is unprecedented. Uh, we're reacting to a crisis we've never seen before, uh, but we're trying to be as responsive as possible. Uh, in January of this year, um, for example, I gave a 10% raise to all of my uh, contract providers specifically so that they could increase the, the um, salaries that they were offering to their workforce in order to improve their recruitment and retention. Um, the Challenges still continue though. So uh, I'm hoping to continue to think about doing even further increases. But the bottom line is that, that we, we're all experiencing a, a severe workforce challenge. And the, 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 a lot of the workforce are going to telehealth type of 
providers where, which are a new thing that have just sprung up dramatically since the pandemic, where they're able to get paid more and not have to go in person. Uh, our folks need to be in person because that's the type of work we do. So we're working very hard at all sorts of creative ways of trying to uh, trying to increase our, our workforce. I mentioned our um, loan repayment program as well that that is helping out those who are who are working within our system. Great, good to hear. Um, I don't think you mentioned this, but someone seems to know about this and wants to know what is the Laura's Law Program. Is that something you're familiar with? Yes, it is. All right, so this is a program that it's, uh, we refer to it as assisted outpatient treatment is the type of program. So it, it was a law that went into California law that at the time it originally started out, it was that um, uh, counties had the option to opt into uh, delivering this program. Um, what the program is, is that if uh, someone has, uh, meets very specific criteria regarding a certain number of uh, fences uh, as a result of a mental illness, uh, criminal offenses as a result of mental illness, or a, a certain number of uh, inpatient psychiatric hospitalizations or so forth. Um, there's a few other uh, specific criteria. If they meet those criteria, then they can be referred to uh, the court in order to um, basically work on um, uh, um, giving them a court ordered uh, treatment. Um, the, the, the other thing we do before that happens though, is we also really actively engage with that individual in order to try to ask them to voluntarily participate in services. And a lot of time just realizing that, that they were going to have to go before a judge in order to sort of talk about their situation is enough for them to wanna to engage in services. Um, so I, I mentioned that at first the law said that counties had the option to opt in. Um, more recently, uh, the law has changed and it is now required for counties to implement assisted outpatient treatment unless counties opt out. So it changed instead of having to opt in. Now, if you don't wanna do it, you have to opt out. Well, um, uh, Sacramento County has uh, uh, decided to implement assisted outpatient treatment um, in January, we went before the Board of Supervisors and uh, received approval for a budget in order to implement that. And we're hoping to uh, implement assisted outpatient treatment this coming, this coming summer. Okay. Uh, we've had a couple of different questions asking about the homeless population and the, the mental health challenges that they have. Is there anything specific that your particular program here in Sacramento is doing for that population? Absolutely. Um, we all of our all of our pro, this is this is a population that we spend a great deal of resources serving. Um, so all, our entire outpatient system, which includes our outpatient programs as well as our what I mentioned earlier, our full service partnership programs, which are the highest intensity of outpatient services, they are all um, uh, equipped with what we call flex funding, which is uh, flexible funding for our providers to be able to identify and be able to um, uh, support people in obtaining housing if they're in one of our programs. And so um, that, that could be pay first and last month's rent, that could be pay utilities bills so you don't get in trouble and have your utilities turned off, it can be uh, anything that might help them uh, prevent eviction. Um, so we, we certainly have those types of resources as part of our programs. And um, I, think, I think the bottom line though is that we, we really do see a very large proportion of homeless individuals. The other part, and, and we, we see good outcomes. Uh, we do see improvements in their homeless uh, rates once they're involved with our programs and we're able to help reduce the, the number of folks who experience homeless within a year, the number of occurrences of homelessness, meaning each time you become homeless, we count that as another occurrence. We're able to decrease the number of occurrences. We also are able to decrease the number of days that somebody is uh, homeless within the course of the year. Uh, um, and then the other thing I was going to mention, we also are, as a part of uh, a new uh, county uh, program, we're calling um, our, I think we're gonna rename it, but we were currently calling it our encampment teams where we have clinicians that are going out with our encampment uh, outreach folks and helping do assessments out in the encampments in order to identify individuals and link individuals to services when they're ready. Sounds great. 
So we've all become a lot more aware that that police in general are, don't seem really prepared or um, able to, to deal with people that have mental health challenges. Is that changing? And, and do you provide any kind of outreach to, to our police department or, or police departments in general to help them become better educated to do the, this interface? Sure, certainly. Across all of Sacramento County, we have really great relationships with our law enforcement partners. And um, it looks, at, uh, there's a few different ways that that um, displays itself. Um, there, there are crisis intervention training programs that we uh, provide trainings to our law enforcement partners around how to respond to a behavioral health crisis. We also have what we call our mobile crisis support teams. This is a specific type of a model where there's a clinician that um, does a ride along with our with a law enforcement partner and uh, these are specialized units that will respond specifically to behavioral health calls as identified by 911 dispatch and or by the officer that she's that he or she's paired with um, that uh, are able to uh, uh, respond to calls that have behavioral health um, component in addition uh, most recently our uh, board of supervisors ask us to uh, put together and they approved a budget for what we're calling our wellness crisis response program, which will um, we're still working on um, implementing. So we don't have that ready yet, but we're working on it. Uh, and that will be uh, another type of response where in, instead of having to call 911, we're hoping you're gonna be able to call uh, another phone number. And instead of getting a law enforcement response to um, a behavioral health call, you will get a clinician what we call a peer, which is somebody with lived mental health experience that will be able to respond to those types of crises. Okay, sounds good. This is probably somewhat of a combination question for both Bill and you, Dr. Quist, but is in Bill's story, the things that he shared about what his challenges are, are they just things he has to deal with or, or can he overcome them? Um, is he likely to have them all his life and he'll just find, continue to have, find ways to, to address them on a day-to-day -day basis? Or is there a cure, I guess, is more of the question. So do you wanna start on that one or? Um, you know, that, <laughs> that was kind of a, that's, it's a really great question because I remember talking to Dr. Zasio in August of 2008 and I asked her that, like, is this curable? And she's like, no, I'm like, wow. That seems not very fun. Um, so yeah, I guess if to say there's a cure, probably not, but it can it be managed and can you live a very normal, fulfilling life mm -hmm. without question? I mean, it's, you know, it's weird, but one of the things I'm so grateful for, for having anxiety, and, and this is kind of, it's kind of a, a it's kind of a weird analogy, but on one hand, if somebody said I could cut off two limbs, any limbs, but I would never experience anxiety again, I would say do it. No doubt in my mind. But the real benefit of having anxiety is my level of empathy. I feel like my anxiety has given me more empathy. It's removed all arrogance. It's allowed my pride to just completely remove itself from my entire life. I mean, it's kind of a weird thing. It doesn't mean you have to be self-deprecating all the time or that you can't be proud of your kids or whatever, but I just feel like it takes that pridefulness, the arrogance, and a lot of things that I personally, I know, had, not on purpose, but it's basically just completely wiped it away and removed it from who I am, and I'm really grateful for that. Part I'll add is that everybody's experience is a little bit different. Um, some some folks ha are able to manage their um, mental health challenges through medications um, or a combination of medications and other cognitive behavioral um, uh, strategies that will help them develop much in the same way that Bill's talked about. It's a it's a coping strategy uh, in terms of the the symptoms are there and how do you then accommodate those and sort of um, 
put your best foot forward um, and and be able to uh, move on with with what what it is that that's before you at the moment. So I, I think it's really a range, and it really depends on each individual's certain uh, specific circumstances. Thank you, gentlemen. So this last question, I think, probably could take the last five or six minutes of our of our time here, but but if you can offer a summary, Dr. Quist. Can, can you talk about the types of treatments that there are for mental illness, or is that too general of a question? There's so many different types of. There are many different illness. types. Um, different types of treatment. Well, uh, the range of services that we provide at, at the county are everything from uh, we have uh, counseling, therapy, we have um, group services, we have uh, case management, we have um, what we call rehabilitation, um, and that's all within the outpatient context. And there's different levels of care. So that's sort of the outpatient level of care for those are experiencing maybe a, 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 a little bit more of a challenge where we're worried that they might be needing an inpatient um, hospitalization if we're not able to help them deal with the crisis. We have something called crisis residential treatment um, we also have, of course, our uh, emergency, uh, one of our, uh, we have crisis stabilization. We also have the emergency departments, which will then also help link to uh, our inpatient psychiatric hospitals. That's sort of a step up through the various uh, levels of intensity and intensity of care. Hey, I, I think you gave at least one phone number and maybe you could give a second as well too. You had a, a hope line or just for kind of talk therapy if you're having if you're in a crisis moment is that what that's for or um tell us what that's for and then give us that phone number again sure um yeah that that's that would be one where if you're needing somebody to talk to because of whatever circumstances you're currently experiencing it's called the hope line and it's 833-871-HOPE um, if you're uh, if you have medical and would like to seek uh services um, our phone number is 916-875-1000. Um, um, and that's for your county department that Correct. if someone is looking for services, they can call. It. Can you give that to us again real quick? Sure. Yeah, and, and then again, this is, it, this is for Medi-Cal beneficiaries. If you have Medi-Cal, if you don't know, um, we'll certainly help you out. Uh, but the number is 916-875-1000. 1055. Very good. Um, let's see. What, what about if someone has Medicare? Do they just go to their own provider for that? Yep. Okay. And are, are just generic providers getting better at having staffing and, and less of a workforce crisis? that they have personnel available in general? We are currently in a workforce crisis and we're all identifying various strategies. You know, when Omicron hit is when it really got bad. So when Omicron hit, and then now here we are, we're just the other side of Omicron. And so um, we're all crossing our fingers that now that the mask mandate's going away and that people are feeling more comfortable being out there in the world, that, um, that we'll start getting more um, interest in returning to the workforce and that our recruitment activities will begin to see some, see some results. Okay. Can people both in Sacramento City and Sacramento County use your services, Dr. Quist? Yes, uh, Sacramento County, County Behavioral Health Services are for the entire county, regardless okay. of jurisdiction. Great, okay. Um, We've gotten more than one comment, Bill, of people thanking you for your courage and willingness to come and share your story. And, and I want to relay that to you as well, too. Um, someone's asked, and we just got a couple of minutes here. I'm not sure if this is a real diagnosis or not, but can homelessness cause temporary street psychosis, whatever that may be? Um, so imagine if I imagine, I'll just talk about me from my perspective. I imagine if I lost my house, that would be a very stressful cir circumstance and that I would probably begin to experience some, some mental health challenges as a result of that. 
So I, I do think that that certainly adds to the stressors of someone's life. Everybody responds to that in a different way. Um, in terms, uh, and the other part of it is that in terms of psychosis, uh, dis uh, disorders that include psychosis, there are a very specific type of um, uh, disorder. And uh, I, I could see that being introduced to extreme shock or trauma could potentially trigger initial um, first episode psychosis um, symptoms. Although I, I, I don't know that we'd say homelessness would, I guess it would be one of the precipitating factors that would be involved. The thing that I'm most worried about as it relates to homelessness and psychosis is the use of drugs. Um, so for example, um, there, methamphetamine, for example, the use of methamphetamine can, um, can result in um, uh, uh, substance use uh, related uh, psychosis symptoms. So that, that is a, a circumstance where, where you would be likely to see that. Okay, well, that's about all the time we have today. I'm sure we could talk for quite a long time more, but um, thank you so much for this invaluable information and, and your personal testimonial as well too, Bill, is just priceless. And I'll uh, send it back to Katie. All right. Thank you both so much for, for coming, for some really valuable insights and perspectives. Uh, as a small thank you gift, we would like to offer each of you an honorary membership in the Renaissance Society. We'll also be making a donation in your name to the Seth Nelson Student Emergency Grant Fund. Thank and everyone, you. remember, <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, everyone out there in the audience, remember that today's presentation was recorded and you can view it and share it with your friends in two different ways on our forum YouTube channel and on the Renaissance Society website under recordings. And so we also want all of you to attend the annual society meeting. It'll be on Monday, May 9th at 1 p.m. over Zoom, so mark your calendars. You'll get a Zoom link invite in your weekly update and constant contact messages, so be on the lookout for that. At the meeting, you'll be able to meet the 2022 Sac State recipients of the Inclusion Award and Student Scholarship and Diversity Award, and you'll hear an update from our board on how the fall semester is shaping up, so we hope you'll join us there. And next, we want you all to vote and make your voices heard. Remind your friends too, if they aren't here today, we need 564 of you to cast your vote this May for the upcoming 2022-2023 year. Most voting will be done electronically and you should have received a constant contact message with instructions on April 18th, just a couple days ago. Print ballots will only be sent to members without emails on file with us those who don't receive constant contact, or if two members share an email. You can see the slate of officers you'll be voting for uh, in the May Recorder newsletter, and the polls close on May 6th. We'd love for you to grab your Renaissance Society buddies and get engaged about who makes the big decisions around here. <laughs> and next week is our final spring forum presentation. And we'll have Dr. Manis here talking about the new UC Davis Channon Eye Institute that broke ground in June, 2020. It should be completed in 2022 on the UCD Sacramento campus. This impressive institute will include cutting edge patient care, inspired educational programs for tomorrow's healthcare leaders and a pioneering research environment that will generate new discoveries in medicine, science and healthcare such as developing cures for blinding eye diseases. We're really re looking forward to having him with us. So thanks everybody for joining us today and we'll regroup next Friday. Bye. <laughs>